hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my presentation on investigating reaction rates. Uh, now, before you um, do anything with this, uh, make sure you're comfortable with the basics of chemistry, and also make sure you're familiar with the basics of rates of reaction as well. There are videos on both of those earlier on in this playlist. Now, um, in this video, we're going to be looking at actually how do you measure chemical reaction rates. We're going to be looking at how you do that specifically with reactions that produce gases, and how you do that for reactions that produce a precipitate. And then we'll be looking at the Edexcel core practical on this topic as well. So what we're going to look at now is actually how do we measure a chemical reaction rate? So the rate of a reaction is the amount of product that you formed um, divided by the time that it took. So then in order to measure that rate, we need to know the amount of product that's been formed and we need to be able to measure the time it took. Now, measuring the time it took is easy. We just use a stopwatch. So the key question is, how do we know the amount of product that has been formed? To do that, we need some kind of observable, measurable change. And exactly what method we use to do that depends on the details of the particular reaction we're studying. It might be that we have to collect a volume of gas, you know, either in a gas syringe or over water. It might be that we measure some kind of color change. Um, it might be that we measure the change in temperature over time. Maybe we measure the formation of a precipitate uh, where the reaction goes cloudy. Perhaps we measure the change in mass. You know, maybe the reaction goes up in mass or goes down in mass, and we have to do it on a mass balance to see how that mass is changing. It might be that we entirely consume some solid. You know, the way that over time and acid will entirely dissolve um, some metal. So whatever it is, we need some kind of measurable change, and then we need to know how long that took, and we can use this equation here to calculate our rate. Okay, so for reactions that produce a gas, we can monitor their rate using one of three methods. Method one is collecting the gas over water, and that looks like this. So we have our reaction bubbling away in a flask, and as the gas is produced, it passes along a delivery tube into an upside down measuring cylinder full of water in a water trough. And so what happens is as the gas bubbles up into our measuring cylinder, it displaces the water. And so the level, uh, the amount of gas collected can just be read off the side of the scale on the measuring cylinder. A more accurate way to do this uh, than collecting it over water is to use a gas syringe. Uh, and that looks like this. So again, we have our reaction bubbling away in our flask. The gas passes through the gas uh, through the delivery tube, and it's collected in this glass gas syringe here. And again, uh, as the gas collects, it pushes the plunger outwards, and we can measure the amount of gas uh, that's been produced using the scale along the side. And our final method is that we can measure the decrease in the mass using a mass balance. So the idea here is that we would have the reaction taking place in a conical flask uh, resting on a balance. And as that gas bubbles away, it will leave the container entirely. And so the mass balance can no longer record its mass. Now, this works much better for dense gases like carbon dioxide than it does for um, low density gases like hydrogen, because it, we get a much bigger reading with a dense gas. Uh, and so with hydrogen, we have um, very tiny readings. The balance struggles to, to, to measure such small changes, so it doesn't work so well. Now, with all these methods, we can do it in one of two ways. We can either record the volume or the mass every 20 seconds, um, or we can um, record how long it takes for a specific amount of change to happen. So maybe, you know, how long does it take for the mass to go down by one gram, or how long does it take to collect 50 centimetres cubed of our gas. Now, what about reactions that slowly produce a precipitate? A uh, precipitate is when a reaction goes cloudy. Now, some reactions do this very, very fast, so this won't work for them. But for ones that slowly produce a precipitate, we can use what we call the obscured cross technique. Now, that works like this. So the first thing we do is we mix our reactants and we start the stopwatch. Then what we do is we place the reacting vessel on top of a black cross on a piece of paper and we look down through it. So that there is supposed to represent an eye and I'm looking down through my reacting mixture as the reaction continues. Now, over time, that reaction mixture will start to get cloudy like that. You can see it's gone a little bit cloudy there. 
and eventually it will get so cloudy that we can no longer see that black cross and at that point that's when we stop our stopwatch and to find the rate of the reaction here all we do is we do one divided by the time that the reaction took so this leads us on to the core practical. Um, now, on the edX cell GCC course, there were three parts to the core practical. The first one was investigating the effect of concentration. So the aim here was to investigate how does the concentration affect the rate of reaction between hydrochloric acid and magnesium. And in this uh, experiment, the independent variable was the acid concentration. The dependent variable was the time it took for the magnesium to disappear. That's the result that we measure. And the controlled variables, the ones that we didn't change, were the temperature, the acid volume, the mass and size and shape of the magnesium pieces. And our method was really simple. We placed a piece of magnesium in a boiling tube of hydrochloric acid. Um, we start the stopwatch and then we stop it once the magnesium has fully reacted, it's disappeared. And we can see that here, we start with a piece of magnesium and by now the reaction, the magnesium has disappeared, so we stop the stopwatch. And then we repeat that at a range of different concentrations. And what we found when we did that was that the greater the concentration, the less the time it took, so the faster the rate was. Um, and we calculated that rate as one divided by the time it took for the magnesium to disappear. Now, part two of the practical was investigating the surface area. So what we did here was we're investigating how does the surface area affect the rate of reaction between hydrochloric acid and calcium carbonate or marble chips. Marble is a form of calcium carbonate. So in this one, our independent variable, the thing that we were changing was the surface area of the marble chips. And we used large, medium and small chips and then powder as well. Um, the dependent variable, the result we were measuring, was the time it took to collect 50 centimetres cubed of the gas. And then lastly, our controlled variables, the things we didn't change, were temperature, acid volume and concentration, uh, and then the mass of the calcium carbonate and also the volume of gas that we were collecting. In terms of our method, we had um, set up the apparatus to collect gas over water. That's in our upturned measuring cylinder full of water. We placed 20 centimetres cubed of 1.0 molar, that's the concentration, of hydrochloric acid in a conical flask. We added 5 grams of marble chips to the flask. We put the bung in place straight away to stop the gas escaping. And then we started the stopwatch. And the stopwatch was collected once 50 centimetres cubed of gas had been um, collected. Um, and so the results were that the smaller the marble chips, the less time it took, so the faster the rate of the reaction was. And this was because of the increased surface area. And to calculate the rate, we did 50. That's the volume collected divided by the time. Now, our last um, part of this practical was the investigating the effect of temperature. And to do this, we were asking, how does the temperature affect the rate of reaction between hydrochloric acid and sodium thiosulfate? Now, importantly, this goes cloudy, um, so we can use the obscured cross method. Now, our independent variable here was the temperature. We did it at 0, 22, 40, and 60 Celsius. 22, by the way, is room temperature. Um, our dependent variable that we measured for our result was the time taken for the cross to disappear, and our controlled variables that we didn't change were volume, the concentration of solutions, and the person judging the disappearance. Now, our method, we had 25 centimetres cubed of sodium thiosulfate and 5 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid in two separate measuring cylinders, and they must be separate to start with, and they're placed in water or ice baths at the set temperature for five minutes. That gets them to the right temperature first. Then what we do is we mix them in a conical flask over a black cross. That's what you can see here. And the stopwatch is started, and then we stop the stopwatch when the cross has disappeared. And we can, uh, what we found was that the hotter the temperature was, the less time it took, so the faster the rate was. And we calculated the rate as 1 divided by the time taken. Okay, so that's it. The end. As always, well done if you got this far, and thank you for listening.